Then Darwin identified the merciless struggle that often results in the elimination of the weakest and the survival of the fittest. Darwin himself wondered whether it was this mechanism that drove the process of species development in nature. A friend of Darwin's, geologist Adam Sedgwick, expressed what he believed this theory could evoke concerning man's ties to God. Were it possible, which, thank God, it is not, to break it, humanity, in my mind, would suffer a damage that might brutalise it and sink the human race into a lower grade of degradation than any into which it has fallen since written records tell us of its history. Nevertheless, Darwin decided to adopt selection as the decisive mechanism to support his theory. Genetic pioneers like Carl Korrens and Niels Heribert Nilsson repeatedly emphasized that selection alone doesn't create something new. It only acts as a filter, like a sieve. Just as a sieve doesn't create new tea leaves, selection doesn't create new forms of life or new species. It can only sift or filter out from what it's given. It can't fundamentally create new forms or species. When Darwin's magnum opus, The Origin of the Species, was published in 1859, it was heralded by many as a revealed truth. What Darwin presented in his book were rational postulates regarding how the Earth's organisms could have come into being. Neither he, the Darwinists, nor neo-Darwinists of today can prove these suppositions with experimental evidence. Karl Marx, who saw the history of mankind as the history of social struggle, was excited by Darwin's book. Darwin's report is of great importance and persuades me as the scientific basis for the historical class struggle. Darwin's theory was wonderfully suited to the dismantling of the concepts of a divine design of nature and of the origin of man, the very concept on which many rulers in history had based their power. In the mid-19th century, the city of Brno belonged to Austria and was the cultural center of Moravia. Johann Gregor Mendel, a young monk and contemporary of Charles Darwin, lived in its Augustine monastery. The burning question of his day was obviously familiar to him. If the different species really were subjugated to constant change, should man be no exception to this? Charles Darwin travelled the world for five years and then spent 25 more developing his theory from amidst a vast and barely comprehensible amount of material. Mendel managed to formulate his theory with a handful of seeds sown in soil in the monastery garden. In distinct contrast to Darwin and Haeckel, Gregor Mendel supported the idea of the constancy of hereditary units. The term gene was coined later. Let's use a concrete example to illustrate. When we cross a red flowering plant with a white flowering plant, in the first generation hybrids, or F1, we obtain pink flowering plants in the intermediary mode of inheritance. According to Darwin and Haeckel, what should happen, that is according to the idea of the inheritance of acquired characters, a mixing of colors should appear, and all the generations that follow would remain pink. In fact, that's not the case, as Mendel was clearly able to prove. In subsequent generations, the traits segregate again. Pure red flowers, pink flowers, and pure white flowers appeared in a clearly defined relationship, one to two to one. Evidently, a mixing of colors didn't take place, and thus the hereditary units remained intact. Mendel was certain he had discovered a law of nature previously unknown which would be of great significance to the future of scientific investigation. In 1866, his research was published in a scientific journal and then sent to more than 120 libraries and universities. Mendel's discovery correctly described biological reality, and yet it carried a conspicuous flaw. It did not confirm the atheist spirit of the times, but rather the infuriating immutability of the species as mentioned ten times in the Genesis account of creation. The reaction to Mendel's discovery was ridicule, rejection or indifference. For example, Ernst Haeckel completely dismissed Mendel's work, 
and he endeavoured instead to substantiate the theory of evolution and elevated the false ideas about heredity based on the ideas of Lamarck to the status of a law. The law of inheritance of deviant or acquired characters basically says nothing more than that, under certain conditions, an organism is capable of passing on traits to its offspring which it first acquired itself during its own lifetime. Today, false beliefs about the inheritance of acquired characters are attributed solely to Haeckel, but Darwin too was wrong. It's obvious that Haeckel based his theories on Darwin's theory. Darwin championed not only the theory of natural selection, but also inheritance of acquired characters. This is what Darwin wrote about the origin of the giraffe. By this process, long continued, which exactly corresponds with what I have called unconscious selection by man, combined no doubt in a most important manner with the inherited effects of the increased use of parts, it seems to me almost certain that an ordinary hoofed quadruped might be converted into a giraffe. Yet what Darwin describes as almost certain is still regarded as scientific speculation today. Conversely, Gregor Mendel's discovery can be explained mathematically. Mendel had Mendel crossbred plants and then, with the help of his fellow monks, made statistical reports based on observation and counting. These reports could be simply expressed in connections and proportions, which could then be expressed in whole numbers. In 1868, elected abbot of his monastery, Mendel found, to his regret, that he had little time left over from his duties as abbot to pursue his scientific research. When he died 16 years later, it is claimed that he said, my time has not yet come. Ernst Haeckel at that time was moving toward the pinnacle of his fame. Haeckel was one of the main proponents of Darwinist theory on the European continent. One cannot overestimate his influence on the ascendance of Darwin's theory to the forefront of scientific achievement. Ceaselessly attempting to support Darwin's theory of evolution, Haeckel claimed that human embryos pass through the various stages of pre-fish, fish and mammals during their ontogenetic development. Similarities are evident in the webs, fins and gills of the embryo. Haeckel's assertions did not go unchallenged by other biologists who felt that they did not correspond to reality. I would like to begin with the remorseful confession that a small part of my numerous embryo illustrations are in fact forged, namely all of those in which the matter available for observation was so incomplete or insufficient that in order to present a coherent chain of development, it was necessary to fill in the gaps with hypothesis. After Haeckel succeeded in establishing the law of the inheritance of acquired characters, he elevated his embryo forgeries to the equivalent of a scientific law, despite the fact that nature displays no parities. Haeckel's supposition has been taught as the biogenetic law or recapitulation theory. The central point of the biogenetic law lies in the assumption that man, and even other animals, pass through embryonic developmental stages that mirror those of their predecessors. That is to say, man, for example, would pass through a fish-like stage. This assertion has been conclusively proven false. It's just not true. At no single point does man resemble a fish or any other animal in his development. He is and remains a human being, and that's also true for his genetic material. And molecular biology doesn't confirm the biogenetic law. Professor Erich Blechschmidt, who led the Anatomical Institute at Göttingen University for many years, came to this conclusion. What has been referred to as biogenetic law was a catastrophic mistake in the history of natural science. In terms of theory and practice, it set biology back an entire century. Blechschmidt's research comes to an unambiguous conclusion that human beings do not evolve into human beings, rather they are human from the moment of conception. Man does not develop into a human, he is human from his very beginning. <laughs>